Hi students, I'm going to uh, do videos uh, per chapter, and that's that's the plan. So we're going to cover the first 17 chapters of the uh, textbook in this class, and I'm, my plan is to have a video for each chapter. So it's kind of an oddball situation that we have here. Um, you know, that I'm I have I have the camera more pointed at the uh, at the, the whiteboard I have in the back, but I mean again I I've tried to. Uh, um, I tried to get a little smarter about how I did things compared with last, uh, you know, the last semester to spring, you know, 2020 semester. And so I'm trying to try to make the class as much or close to a face to face you would expect as possible. Uh, with that said, um, I'd like to point out a couple of things. Uh, first of all, as I have told you before um, in the previous previous uh, lecture, the book we're using this class is called Physics by Cutnell and Johnson. This is the college physics book. Uh, basically, it's uh, David Young and, and uh, Shane Stadler are the authors. Again, you should see 11th edition. That's very important to you. 11th edition of this book. Uh, let me give you an ISBN number if that helps. Um, I'll write it down. Uh, so the ISBN number of this book that we're using in this class ISBN is, um, well, let's see here, it's 978-1-119-39187-6. six. And for those of you, you know, who want to use look at an ISBN number again, that that says um, 978-1-119-39187-6. Uh, and then there's a little bit of a glare on the whiteboard. Let's see if I can try to fix that. Oh, boy, it's not going to go well. Let's see. All right. Oh, there's a... Sorry to put the glare in a spot that's not going to be so such a pain, I guess. Oh, well. I'll try to avoid the glare, the little glare spot of the light bulb. Anyway, um, so again, this is the book we're going to use in the, in the class. Again, now, I'm going to reference, as we're becoming scientists, I'm going to constantly reference a book that we uh, first used when this class first started. And that book is OpenStax College Physics. And again, that's uh, that's that book there, OpenStax College Physics, OpenStax. Um, and I'll actually send you a link on it. So, so again, this is the this is the actual textbook that we will use in this class. Okay, the book I just gave you. You know, the uh, this is the uh, this is the Cutnell and Johnson. And this is the book, you know, where I will uh, guide the class in this book, and we will have all of our problems out of this book. Okay, Cutting on Johnson is the main book of this class. No other book. I will reference the first book that was actually used when I taught this class starting in 2017, and the reference is going to be OpenStax. College Physics. Okay? OpenStax College Physics. And again, that's a book that was first used uh, in this class um, when, when I started. In, in, in this book was used for about a year, year and a half. And then they changed it. I will send you the link to this book. Uh, as I give lectures, I will give lectures. I um, mean, I will be constantly referring to problems on this book because, first of all, I think this. I think Open Stacks is is by is much a much superior book. Number one, uh, and um, I think the problems are are better, and I think they're more you know applicable as learning devices for you. And um, and quite honestly, um, you can reference that book. I mean, the nice thing about this book is you can actually download it uh, from the Rice University website for free. You know, which uh, you know the uh, this this uh, Cutnell Johnson book costs on the on a neighborhood of about a hundred and 
$150, you know, and you might be able to get yourself a deal by using a loof leaf version of it. But again, it's going to cost you a lot of money where you can, you can download the PDF uh, from, um, now, from Rice University for OpenStax for free. So, again, I'll, I'll give you the link for that. But this is only for reference. Problems will only, when I give problems in this book, problems will only come out of Cutton and Johnson. I want to make that clear because oftentimes in previous classes it was not clear for some reason. I'm going to try to make it clear, okay, to you guys. Okay, now, that's the textbooks. So, you know, again, I'm not really going to be talking about a lot of uh, introductory stuff in, in – my my other uh, chapters or other lectures but I, I mean there's a number of different things i think you know some uh some basic uh, uh when uh i guess you call foundations have to be kind of discussed when you start a class and so all right so i'm gonna raise what's on the board here all right well let's talk about physics um so we're gonna cover again this is the chapter one lecture and so chapter one is a little bit more a little more involved than typical chapter ones in most books. Um, this book's actually going to just give you the basics, but it's also going to give you your lecture on vectors. I don't in the previous in the previous uh, book, the lecture on vectors waited until chapter three. I typically like to give the students the new math as they have the, the as they have the application at hand to actually apply the math. So we're gonna go, so we're gonna go, why, why learn the new math when you're not gonna use until say chapter three, right? But for some reason this book, I mean, and that's, that was the approach by Cottonell and Johnson. I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry. That was the approach by the OpenStax. That's not the approach by Cottonell and Johnson for some reason. Now, since we're using Cottonell and Johnson, I have to play uh, with that style. So anyway, um, so with that said, this, this, this class is going to cover chapter, one. I mean, that's what, I'm sorry. This class is going to cover chapter one through seventeen. This lecture is going to cover chapter one. And so, in chapter one, I'm going to talk about basics. You know, basically, like what is physics? Okay. And then um, I want to actually go and talk about vectors. So, and again, if you don't know what vectors are yet, well, well, we'll find out very briefly or very soon. All right. So let's talk about, first of all, you know, what is physics? And so, you know, if we, we you know, kind of like if you kind of go back to, uh, if anybody's ever been to a Renaissance fair before, you know, though you walk into the Renaissance fair, you know, they pretend that it's old England and you, you walk into the Renaissance fair and they'll tell you as you're walking in, it's. England 1540 something right I mean you walk in and then that's what they try to reenact as if you are actually in England at that point in time well what I like to say is I like to kind of teach this class in a chronological way and essentially say that you know we are starting in about you know we're, look, we're looking at around 1500 so we're at about 1500 okay and in 1500 there was nothing now you might say well you know there, there was certain some sort of technology you know there was bronze and iron and and people had armor and things like that and they, they had the wheel well the technology that they had was more or less accidental there was no science at this point in time right at this point in time we had absolutely no science that we knew of so we we're literally starting from nothing you know when i teach physics two i actually can reference the entirety of physics one which is nice. When you do in physics one, you start off with absolutely nothing. And that's where we're starting from. The only thing I, I am, the only assumptions I am making from your background right now is your math assumptions. I'm assuming you have algebra, geometry, trigonometry, Or the equivalent of pre-calculus. And that's the assumption I'm making right now uh, regarding what you where you come into this class. I am making no assumption about any prior scientific knowledge. We are going to start from scratch, and I'm going to prove everything that we talk about in this class. Everything in this class. I don't expect you to believe a single word out of my mouth. 
I expect, you know, that I'm, I'm going to literally prove everything that I discuss in this class. Okay, so we're at a point where, you know, so, you know, you might, you might wonder, well, why, why, you know, why, how in the world, if we have no science, do we still have some sort of technology at that point in time? You know, clearly we have armor and we have bronze and we have things like that. Well, it's kind of like things are, it's kind of like when you're making a cake. You know, you may not necessarily know how to make a cake. However, someone's made a cake and they say, oh, well, I mean, I have no idea what's what's going on, you know, the chemistry of, of a cake, but I do know this much. I have a recipe. Have I put this many eggs, this much flour, this much sugar, and so on and so forth, I will make a cake. I may have no idea about the chemistry or physics behind this cake, but I do know this much. If I follow some sort of a recipe, I can make that cake. So someone, through some happenstance, figured out some sort of recipe or I also liken it to like, you know, you see the commercial of the, you see one guy walking along, you know, you, you see they're about to, they're about to bun, run into each other in a corner. One guy's got a chocolate bar in his hand. The other guy, the other guy on the other, on the other side of the corner has got a, a jar of peanut butter and they, and they crash into each other as they climb, as, as they come around the corner at the same time. And, and the guy's got his chocolate bar and a peanut butter and they both come up and they both eat the, you know, their very first ever Reese's. And that's wow, wow, I didn't know this tasted good together. You know, so so again, it's one of those kind of things that eventually somebody discovers something and they and they record how they discovered it. And that's how science was done at this point in time. Science was basically done through just random discoveries. And and and, and somebody wrote down, hey, I like that new metal that we just made. Uh, let's how did I do that again? How did I smelt that metal? How did I how I, you know what, what what process did I you know I write that process down so that some other blacksmith can go and do the same thing that I did. That's all that was going on then. We had no scientific understanding, we had no scientific method, we had no kind of understanding of the atom or anything like that. You know, we basically had almost no understanding of science, you know, where we're starting in this class. Okay, so so the question is, you know, with that said, then what is, what really is physics? First and foremost, and we're going, going down to the, the, the real basics here. What is physics? Well, physics, you know, so, so essentially the universe is based on the language of mathematics. You know, it's funny. I had a I had a roommate back in college. One of my I had a few roommates, and uh, he was from Germany, German guy. And he was looking at a you know there's you know, it's a lot a lot of times when you're more of an advanced uh, physics math person, you have a what's called a CRC math book. You have a basically it's a it's a it's a math guide, if you will, that pretty much has uh, in one volume, one book, all the major. Uh, theorems and and um uh, and, and and uh important pieces of information of mathematics all the mathematics you've ever studied so you reference this book you know do an integral calculus you say i'm gonna look up this integral and you you know you basically or whatever it is that you're trying to do trigonometric identities or whatever all of it's located in this book and so it's interesting is i went i went to his room and i, I and i looked at the book and i looked at the mathematics first and i totally understood everything he was doing I understood all the X's and the Y's and everything else. Then I looked, read a little bit further down and I saw a uh, language that I did not understand at all, and that was German. And I'm like, how very interesting in that this book may have been, I mean, the mathematics may have all been put in an English book. It's the exact same mathematics. And yet, you know, you go to the vernacular to try to explain what it is that you do. So he actually, he actually, when he came to the United States, he actually came here not knowing very much English at all. And he actually understood the mathematics and he kind of, and as, as he was taking classes, he realized, oh, okay, that's how they say this in in English. Oh, okay, that okay, that's that momentum, okay, or or energy, or whatever. And, but he understood the mathematics already. The mathematics was universal, all right. And so, you know, uh, Galileo once said that God made the universe in the language of mathematics. And so, mathematics is the act, is the universal language of the universe. Physics is one layer of abstraction from mathematics. And so physics literally touches the language of the universe. 
And so if you if you imagine, you know, drawing mathematics down here at the at the bottom of this, I'm gonna make a little diagram. And on the base of everything is mathematics. And that's the base of, of the universe. That's the base of everything. Physics is one abstraction. It's a it's a it is a level of science, it is a body of science that literally touches the universe, and it does so through what we call the laws of physics. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Now, a lot of you guys live a little higher up. So if you uh, look at, if you go one step higher up in the diagram, you have chemistry. So chemistry relies on physics. So if you know, if you look at the, you know, if you look at, you know, a lot of your thermodynamics you'll study, you'll realize when you study thermodynamics in this class, uh, you'll realize that the chemistry is just a, just basically utilizing what the physicists already did. Or if you look at, you know, uh, what is what really is chemistry? Chemistry is quantum physics, the physics of electrons, the physics of the atom. That's all. That's that's all. That's that's what chemistry really is. It's, it is how does one chemical, how does one element interact with another, and it does through it does so through valence electrons, which is atomic physics, which is quantum physics. Okay. Well, you know, those of you who take physics too, will we'll, we will study that. Then higher up, maybe where a lot of you guys live, is like biology and maybe geology. So they, they're further away from physics. So biology is really a biochemistry of geology. You do a lot of chemistry with geology. If you go into chemistry, you interact with physics. And of course, with physics, that's where you directly interact with mathematics. So, I mean, I was given this diagram for the first time by the, I mean, I was lucky enough to have my physics one uh, in, my, in my freshman year from the chair of the physics department. He drew this very diagram. And he kind of made a little jokes as well. A lot of times people say to be a, to be a great biologist, you have to be a good chemist. And to be a great chemist, you have to be a good physicist. And to be a great physicist, you have to be a good mathematician. And he said, well, to be a great mathematician, you just got to be smart. Right? And so and so one of those things is that, you know, it, it's it's like you know, to essentially this, this overall encompassing network of the sciences, you know, this is the, the base of all the sciences. Physics is the base. Physics is where you... You are directly hooked into the universe, okay? And so a lot of you guys, like, you know, you you know, there's a lot of things that you're going to go to medicine or whatever. You know, a lot of the chemistry, you know, you'll realize that, you know, you take the MCAT, for instance, you got you to know those physics. I mean, you can't really do chemistry without physics. And so a lot of times, you know, you you, you want to have a well-rounded education. You know, you you basically are doing, are, are uh, having to take physics, all right? And that's why you're in this class, because whatever your major is, the people who govern that major, the people who are, on, you know, who are the governors of that major have determined that this is the, that you need this as part of your curriculum. Okay. Now, moving on. So we talk about, you know, in, in this class, we talk about, uh, you know, and there's a number, or there's a number of different words that were born in science. But when they get to the vernacular, they get morphed or, or, or to the point where they may, even, may, they may even be misused. One of those words is the word theory. Okay, and so we talk about the word theory. Again, this is a bona fide scientific term, theory. People use the word theory all the time, and most of the time they, they misuse it. Okay, so theory is um, a mathematical framework. that predicts I would say precisely predicts a class of physical problems And it is based 
on a fundamental sense of laws and or principles. Still on the camera here. Again, it's a mathematical framework. The important thing is it predicts a class of physical phenomena. It is a framework that hopefully is, is self-contained and at the very base of it, at the very base of it are laws of physics. Okay, so, so again, the laws of physics that we, you know, I'll talk about what those are in a moment. They are the basis of what we call a theory. Okay, now in this class, we are going to cover two major theories. Okay, we'll cover two major theories in this class, and one theory is called the uh, is called mechanics. What does it do? It um, it uh, is a theory for the motion. Of bodies and essentially it's the motion of bodies that are um, uh, in a solid liquid or gaseous phase in all modes of motion. You'll hear me say this many times. Objects move three possible ways. They either do translation. It means they just move as if they were a point particle. They do rotation. And they wrote, they have a, now we don't want to talk about point particles anymore. Now we're talking about something that has more of a, a physical extent and rotates about an axis like a baseball, for instance, spinning baseball, and vibration. And that is different parts of the body are moving with respect to each other. Typically in a sinusoidal way, right? That's a fancy way of saying back and forth. Uh, vibration, there you go. So mechanics, it's theory of the motion of bodies in the solid, liquid, or gaseous phases, and all modes of motion, translation, rotation, and vibration. Okay? That's one theory we're going to cover. Now, that mechanics is based upon, um, okay, I'll let you write this down, but mechanics is based upon four what we call laws. Okay? So, mechanics is based upon four laws of physics. And we don't know what these, you know, we, we haven't covered these, of course. We're just, this is just uh, basically the first minutes of this class. But we have Newton's first law, Newton's second law. I'm not going to explain what these are yet. We'll talk about them. Newton's third law. And what is called the conservation of energy. We don't even know what energy is yet. So again, it's one of those things that everybody seems to know what it is. But I, I, uh, I'll tell you, if you ask anybody for a definition of what energy is, they will not be able to give you such a definition. Yet we use the word all the time. Okay. All aspects of anything in motion, in any, in any of those phases of matter or in any of those modes of motion, can all be answered by the application of just four principles, four laws. Okay? Nothing else. All right, and so what is a law of physics? A 
It is a behavior. That is always true. But does not have a fundamental cause. Or does not have, let's see if this, I can still see this, a more primary cause. Sorry about my handwriting here. Again, this says law of physics. It is a behavior that is always true, but does not have a more primary cause. It is the primary cause. If you were to go and have, let's say, like you talk to like an eight-year-old, you know, you have like the, all the, you know, the why questions. You know, someone might, you know, this person might ask you, uh, why is that? Well, it's because of this. Well, why is that? Well, it's because of this. Eventually, you'll get to a question where the answer is some law of physics, like Newton's second law. If the next question is, why is Newton's second law? The answer to that is nobody knows. That's as far as you go in physics. That is a fundamental so you get to the bottom of a theory, you don't go any further than that. That is a fundamental. You could say if you, you know, let's say if you have a religious belief, you could say that uh, it is that God made it so. But the, the reality is, this is where science ends. This is where physics ends, is that we have this, we have a foundational uh, behavior that we, that it is the way the universe behaves. And that's as far as we go. Okay, and so so it's kind of like when you took geometry. Geometry was the very first ever proof-oriented math class you took. And so when you go to geometry, you know, it, the whole class is based upon theorems. You know, you start off in the beginning of the class, and you, and you prove a theorem, and the next thing you know, you have two theorems. You use those theorems, combine those, and make another theorem. And then before you know, you have a complicated, you have a complicated subject of geometry. However, there's two things that ev all of geometry uh, re, um, relies on that you can never prove. One is a point and one is a line. You will never prove a point, you'll never prove a line. You have to take those as given. Take those as fundamental starting blocks, starting points. And from there, all the geometry is built up. That is what a law of physics is. Those are what the laws of physics are. You have a very nice, beautiful, complicated, you know, theory of mechanics. But it all starts from these four laws, these four principles. Everything is, is, is founded on those. All right. That takes us deeper into the semester. And then we have another theory we talk about. And this is, about, you know, again, the mechanics is all about the theory of uh, objects of motion or substance of motion in some cases. But then you have another theory, and that is called thermal physics. This is really the physics of energy transformation. It invokes concepts like heat and temperature. You know, concepts that when you talk about mechanics, you'll never talk about those. But, you know, we clearly know that temperature, you know, you... You know, you, you use a thermal a thermometer to let, measure your, if you're sick, you measure your, your body temperature with a thermometer or you want to know how hot it is outside. You know, heat is very important. We you know when a hot day, we know, we certainly know the presence of heat. And so, you know, those are, there's a whole theory, scientific, you know, theory with that. And it's based on four laws as well. We have what is called the zeroth law of thermodynamics. And then we have the first law of thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics, and you actually have the third law of thermodynamics as well. We're not going to talk much about the zeroth and the third law. Most of thermodynamics is driven by the first and second laws. And then that takes us all the way through chapter 16. And there's one more chapter, well, actually that takes us through, I think, chapter 15, maybe 16. And then there's one more subject to go, and that's the subject of waves. So chapter 17, we discuss the concept of waves. And in waves, you know, waves are kind of interesting. You might say, well, 
Uh, what what theory do they belong in? Well, you can have matter waves. You can have waves in a string. You can have water waves. So now you have fluid mechanics or mechanics. You can have electromagnetic waves. So now you have electricity and magnetism. It turns out that waves are actually a fundamental state of being. You know, that things at all, and when you get to quantum theory, you find out that all things in the universe are either, either exist as a particle or as a wave. And so waves, you know, we initially, you know, talk about them as a, as a disturbance that propagates. And again, if that doesn't make any sense to you, that's, that's okay. Well, it'll make sense to you when we get to chapter 17. But in reality, waves really are deeper than that, much deeper. And so, again, we'll, we'll discuss that as, 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 you know, the course goes. And so, essentially, that's, that's what we're talking about here. We have, you know, we talk about today, we talk about laws of physics, we talk about, we talk about theories. So, and, and when you go to physics 2, we'll cover another theory. Physics 2, you have electromagnetic theory. You'll find out that that theory is based upon five equations, five laws. Four of them are called the Maxwell equations, which govern magnetic fields, electric fields, space, and time. And the other one's a force law. And in fact, in physics, in this cl um, uh, class in physics, we'll actually cover one of the four fundamental force laws. We'll actually cover, you know, there are four fundamental force laws. And in physics one, we cover one of them, and that is Newton's law of universal gravitation. Now, basically, another way of saying gravity. That's the only one we're going to cover in physics one. In physics two, we have the electromagnetic force. Some people call that the Lorentz force. I'm not going to focus too much on these because we're because some of you may take physics too and some of you may not. And then we go to the nucleus of an atom. We have two nuclear forces. We have the strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. This is inside the nucleus. Very, very short range forces. These are forces that exist because an object has a certain characteristic. We'll find out that, for instance, Newton's law of gravitation, two objects that have mass attract each other. They attract each other only because they have mass. That's the property they must possess. If you're a massless particle like a photon, you don't have that kind of attraction. Or a neutrino, for instance. Electromagnetic force, two bodies attract each other because of a characteristic they have called electric charge. If a body does not have electric charge, they do not have electrical attraction, they do not have a magnetic interaction. A body must have an unbalanced charge in order to participate in, electromag in electromagnetic theory. Okay, and so again, I'm not going to talk about the nuclear forces, but you know, again, there's a similar kind of a kind of way about you know being a nucleon and so on and so forth. But but essentially, you know, this is you know this is uh, area of physics. These, we, we don't know why Newton's second law of universal gravitation is true. We also don't, why, don't know why the electromagnetic force is true. Again, these are laws of the universe. They exist. They're there. We have, they're left for us to discover. But the reality is, you know, we, we didn't even know that laws of, of the universe even exist until Isaac Newton was the first person to actually tell us about laws of physics. So through most of the history of humanity, you know, the concept of laws of physics that govern everything wasn't even known. Okay. Okay, so that's the overall view of this course. Now, what we're going to do is, you know, in, in physics, you know, I'm just going to cover, I'm just going to kind of cover now some real basic uh, items to kind of get us going. Then we'll talk about what are called vectors. All right. And again, I'm not, I'm not a, a big fan of talking about vectors this early, but that's how this textbook likes to, likes to approach things. Uh, and so, I kind of want to start off by just talking, and again, this, this first uh, lecture is very, very basic. Um, and so coming off of, you know, with, with that in, set, in, in mind, I'm hoping that a lot of you guys have walked into this class knowing a lot of this. Um, but again, this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to cover a lot of things in class that I hope, hopefully for a lot of you is old hat. Um, but um, I got to cover it anyway. So, okay. So in, in, in physics, 
you know, we have we have to talk about units. Okay, so let's kind of go back to the real basics here. So you have to, for, for you to be able to do any kind of science, you got to be able to measure something. And in fact, you need to be able to measure something in a system where you can communicate that to somebody else somewhere else in the world. And so what we uh, generally will do is we'll find out that all of our units of physics are fundamentally based upon a time, a mass, and a length. Okay, so when you go to force and energy and everything else, all of those are just combinations of time, mass, and length. Time, mass, and length are the most fundamental of all. Okay, and so most of the world, except the United States, uses a very smart system called, it's called Le Système International. Essentially, the International System of Units. In short, we refer to this as SI, Système International. Um, we also refer to this as the metric system. So if you head off to Canada or Mexico or France or Spain or anywhere else in the world, you're going to be using SI units. You know, you, you know, it's one of those things I was driving in Canada a little while, a couple years ago. I always kind of like, you know, I'm trying to get used to kilometers per hour. You know, it's like, because everything is, everything, I'm used to miles per hour. You know, our system is archaic. You know, we use this archaic system, but, um, which I'm not really sure why we do that. But um, anyway, that's what we use. And so we'll have to talk about our system a little bit too. Most of what we're going to live, we're going to talk about is the SI unit. So the SI unit for, for, the, for the time is the second. In fact, that's the SI unit for our English, what we call the English system as well. Uh, the SI unit for the mass is the kilogram. Uh, if you want to talk about mass in the SI system, we actually would most of the time talk about pound mass, even though pounds is a force. And in some cases, you actually would talk about what's called a slug, S-L-U-G. That would be the mass, uh, true mass in our English system that we use. All right. And the length. The typical, the fundamental length for the SI system is the meter, okay? And, um, you know, we'll have things like feet, inches, miles, stuff like that, right? So, so again, we'll, we'll, I'll talk about, you know, these various things. But, again, everything is based upon these fundamental units. And so later on, you know, if you want to talk about, let's say, force, you know, we'll talk about what's called Newton's second law. I mean, I'm just going to write in a real basic form here, but force equals ma, for instance, right? And so what would that be? Well, that would be a kilogram, and we'll find out that acceleration is a, is a, is a length per time squared. So a kilogram meters per second squared. Okay, look at this. I have a force, but it's just in terms of length, mass, and time. If I have something like a, ma a mass times a length divided by a time squared. Well, if it's in SI units, we call this a Newton. So the force in SI units is the Newton. You know, we talk about so many Newtons of force. But in front, but you know, we might use the letter N, capital N, for that. But again, when you want to break it all down, a Newton is nothing more than a combination of mass, length, and time. We can go a little further. Again, we haven't studied any of this yet, but I'm just gonna, you know, I'm just I'm just really doing it in the case of units. So we have what's called work. It's a form of what we call energy, right? Well, it turns out that that's like a force times a distance, right? And what's that gonna be? Well, that's gonna be like a newton times a meter, right? But what's a newton? Oh, newton's that, right? So that's gonna be kilogram meters per second squared. So what we have here is a kilograms meters squared per second squared. And when we see a combination of units in SI like that, we call that an energy unit. We call that a joule. And we'll give it a symbol, capital J. That doesn't look like a J very well, but I'm going to rewrite that. Call that a J. 
And essentially, um, we have an energy in it. But in the most fundamental way, energy is what? It is broken down in so much math, so much mass, so much, so much length, so much time. And we'll find out that any of the units that we use in this class, when you get down to the fundamental sense, they are based on time, mass, and length. Okay? Now, what we want to do is we, we want to have a way so of, of um, communicating this. And so, you know, for instance, we have a very, uh, a very um, precise way of communicating. You know, if you go to what's called NIST, National, uh, in, uh, um, uh, what's it stand for? Uh, science, science and technology. Measure, it's a, it's a, people do the measurements. Um, name's escaping me right now. But um, they will actually uh, define these units extremely accurately, very, you know, or very, very precisely. Uh, they'll have a very, you know, use a cesium atom, it's a particular state of, you know, a cesium atom to define for instance, the you know the time and the mass. You have a very special way of of, of defining the mass, and, if, and you have another way of using the speed of light to define the meter. And so, anywhere you, you go in the world, if I explain to if I explain to have you know meters, kilograms, whatever, if I give a mass or a length or something to anybody else in the world, they should know what I'm talking about. They should know exactly what I'm talking about because they understand what these masses mean. All right, I'm sorry, they understand what these units mean. So again, I'm, I'm able to communicate scientific knowledge and tell people extents and and you know and amounts and, and values that other people in the world are going to be able to automatically understand. Okay. Now I'm going to talk more about the SI system because that's really the system that pretty much everybody uses. As a professional scientist, you'll find out that you'll basically work in that system, and then let's say you have an American customer. Well, at the very, very end, what you just do is you'll just convert whatever the units are to the English units so that American customer can understand what you're talking about, right? And so, but at any rate, um, one of the nice things about the metric system is it, it's based upon powers of 10. So the metric system... is based on powers of 10. Nice round number. And so and what I mean by that is, okay, yes, the base unit for, let's talk about length, for instance. The base unit for length is the meter, right? But the kilometer is what? That's a thousand meters. A thousand is a power of 10, 10 to the third, right? So 10 to the third meters, which equals a thousand meters, is a kilometer. We automatically, you know, we have this, you know, we have this uh, concept of a kilometer, kilo, kilo meaning a thousand. Uh, for instance, I can also go, let's say a centimeter is one one hundredth of a meter. Again, another power of two, 10 to the negative two. We call that a centimeter, centi. Or I can have one over a thousand, or ten to the negative three meters. We refer to that as one millimeter. And again, we can we can do this over and over again. And so, for instance, I can I can essentially I can and I can do this for any of the other units. I can do this for seconds. I can have a millisecond. I can have a I can have a you know a kilosecond. I, I can have whatever I whatever what, whatever unit I use. I can apply these prefixes. <clears throat> and so, just you know, hopefully, this is a lot of review. You know, just kind of just kind of review things just a little bit here. So, I have a nano. Well, actually, I can even, I can go further up than that. I mean, we're not going to use some of these higher order ones, you know, until we get to you know physics too. But I can go to femto. That's 10 to the negative 15. I have a femtometer. That's 10 to the negative 15 meters. It's a very, very small amount. The, si the size across a nucleus is on the order of femtometers. I can go pico. 
That's 10 to the negative 12. That's a trillionth of something. I go nano. That's 10 to the negative 9. A nanometer. Like the size of uh, bacteria. Nanometer. 10 to the negative 9 meters. 10 nanometer. Nanosecond. A billionth of a second. Then I go to, let's see, micro, uh, micro, that's 10 to the negative 6, that's a millionth, micrometer, a millionth, microsecond, a millionth of a second. And then I go milli, that's 10 to the negative 3, like a millimeter, so thousandths of a meter, for instance. I have centi, that's 10 to the negative 2, and deci. 10 to the negative 1. Uh, let's see. I have, uh, what's another important one? I have kilo. 10 to the 3rd. Uh, mega. Capital M. 10 to the 6th. Okay, I have, uh, let's see, giga. 10 to the 9th, and I can even go as far as like Terra, I think it's T-E-R-A, that's 10 to the 12th. And so literally, you know, in the computer industry, we'll have megabytes, like, you know, a size of this video file will probably be in megabytes. I can have something that's really big, computer-wise, I can have, I can be talking about gigabytes, and I can even go to the point, I, when I was younger, I never thought I'd I never thought I'd hear people say this all the time, but they do. That's terabytes. You know, you have a you can have a, you can have a terabyte server or something. You know, or, or you know, basically we're talking about you know uh, a a trillion. Ten to the ninth is a this is a mega a million. Ten to the ninth is a billion. Ten to the twelfth is a trillion, like a trillion bytes. Literally, we'll talk about in terms of terabytes in some cases nowadays. In computer systems. You know, talking about things at this level, you have to talk about astronomy oftentimes. You know, you're talking about very, very big distances. Okay? All right. So, again, that's what we have. Um, and so you can do conversions quite easily. So, oftentimes, we'll, you know, we'll want to do conversions. So, for instance, we might say, um, I have 2,000 meters. And I want to convert that to kilometers. What do I do? Well, I basically multiply by one. But I multiply by one in a very special way. I take one distance, of, let's say a kilometer, the distance that I'm going to, and I divide it by its equivalence in meters. Now, can I do a little algebra here? Now, again, this is multiplying by one. The length of a kilometer is equal to the length of a meter. So I'm taking one length and divided by another length that are exactly the same size. And I'm doing this in such a way where now I can do a little, little bit of algebra and I can basically cancel out the meters. What do I now have? 2,000 divided by 1,000 is 2. I have 2 kilometers. We call this the factor ratio method. And hopefully you've, you've covered that in previous school. But again, you know, we're going to be doing things like this. We're going to be making conversions all the time. And all we're going to really do is, 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 is multiply in such a sense where we multiply a certain factor such that we can go from one, one uh, unit to another unit. And this becomes more interesting, let's say, if you're going from one something like uh, feet to meters or to miles. You know, you, you have these... So let's say if I, I give you, um, I ask, I ask you to say, uh, I don't know, I'm, I want, I want to, I want to figure out how many kilometers or are in, are in three miles. Okay, I'm gonna have to probably get my computer, my calculator out for this one. But let's say I, I give you three miles, and again, you have to kind of look this up. Say, okay, I have three miles. That's one of those crazy uh, English units we, that my professor doesn't like. So let's see here. Well, let's see. What do, what do I know about miles? Well, one thing I know about miles is I can go from miles to feet. I know it's 5,280 feet. 
in a mile. And again, I, I multiply them by one. Because basically, the extent of one mile and the extent of one uh, 5,000 feet are the exact same length. And I can do a little algebra and cancel out miles. Now I have whatever this, whatever 3 times 5280 is, I have that now as how many feet I have. But I, I don't, what did I tell you? I said kilometers, right? So let's see, I got to go another another conversion. So I happen to know that a meter, I'm trying to go to a meter. I mean, I'm going to go to a meter right now, so I'm going to metric finally. And I know that there's 3.281 feet in a meter. And cancel off feet. Now, whatever this multiplication and division is, it now gives me so many meters. And then I got one more, you know, one more uh, factor on this train here. And that is I got to multiply out to kilometers. So I got a kilometer. That's what I'm going to. And it's equivalent to 1,000 meters. All right. And so if I multiply all this out, and again, I'm, I'm not Carl Gauss, so I need a calculator. Um, so I, at the end of this, all my gains have canceled. I end up with kilometers. So I take, let's say I take three, and I multiply by 5,280. All right. I get that big number. I divide by 3.281, and I divide by 1,000. And I come to find out that 3 miles is equal to, when I do this big calculation, I get 4.83-ish kilometers. And you remember, you know, your conversion could also say there's 1.6 kilometers in a mile. You know, that's another conversion. I did things the hard way to kind of show you, you know, uh, what a set of conversions might just be. You, you may not just, you may not just end up doing one conversion. You might have to do multiple conversions. All right. So anyway, that's what you can do with these units is that you essentially know the equivalences. And then, and again, you, you essentially, um, I mean, I, I put in this calculation a few things that we know, you know, for instance, we know that there's one meter, 3.281 feet. A uh, mile is 5,280 5, feet. Um, I think 1.6 kilometers, 1.60 kilometers equals one mile. Might be another conversion. Uh, there's other conversions to energy. And so, again, as I mentioned in the, in the English system, you know, sort of in the SI system force, we have newtons. Well, in the, in the English system, we have pounds. And so one of the conversions is our 4.448 newtons in one pound. One conversion, you know. Again, when we get to when we talk about forces, we'll care about that. Um, we, you know, we also have, you know, in English system we have joules. I'm uh, sorry, uh, in the metric system we have joules. In the English system we have what are called calories. Calories is unit in the, in, 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 the, in the English system. Um, typically, what we call a calorie, like a food calorie, is actually a kilocalorie. It's actually a thousand calories. So we would call it a capital C calorie as opposed to a small c calorie, which would be the actual or that a calorie actually is. And so again, we 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 typically will work in these uh, system units, and we find out that we get the thermodynamics. We have another goofy system, you know. We have another temperature system um, system called Fahrenheit, and then you know the rest of the world uses the metric version, what we call Celsius. And so we're going to constantly be, you know, uh, in units that you know that we want to work in as professionals. But, um, you know, you have, a let's say, an, an American customer, you know, that person's going to look at you funny if you tell them something in, in meters or you give them something in newtons. They're not going to know what you're talking about in many ways. You have to give it to them, you know, give, give your customer, speak the customer's language, give, give the customer, you know, the answer they're looking for in the units that they're used to. Okay. So... And, and typically, as a scientist, you do that at the very, very end. You do all your calculations and everything else in metric, and then you, then you do the final conversion to, you know, to to speak to whoever you're going to speak to. Okay. So again, that's uh, the basics of what I want to talk about. Um, now let's talk about vectors. Now again, typically, this is not something we talk about in chapter one, but in this, in your book, uh, they they want to do so. All right. So in your life leading up to physics one, you've been perfectly happy doing all of anything in your life that's numerical in terms of what are called real numbers. 
Okay, so real numbers, you know, so real numbers, you know, they include, you know, your 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 integers, your rational numbers like fractions. And your irrational numbers, square root of 2, square root of 3. So I'll give you an example here, 1 half, 1 fourth, whatever. Um, irrational numbers might be the square root of 2. You, irrational numbers are basically numbers that you cannot write down in one sitting. I can write down 1 half in a decimal, 0 0.5. I can write 1 fourth as a decimal, 0 0.25, and I'm done. I can't do any better any better job than that. Square root of two, I could sit for the rest of my life writing out the square root of two, and I'll never finish. It's irrational. All I can do, ever do is approximate it. Now, another one might be square root of three. Another one might be pi. 3.14, blah, 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 blah. You know, you, you can go on forever trying to write out pi. You'll never finish. But, but anyway, you know, these are numbers that... That essentially, they obey the basic rules that we're used to. You know, if I have real numbers and I say a plus b, well, that's equal to b plus a. No problem. If I say a times b, it's equal to b times a. Um, and so certain things that I just take for granted, um, you know, I, I can do those things in real numbers. We'll find out that, you know, the commutative property of multiplication most of the time fails. When we talk about higher level math, when we talk about other mathematical objects other than real numbers, all right? And we have to define what it means to add or multiply these objects, all right? So, again, we're used to real numbers. And all your life, you've just been dealing with real numbers. Well, we can't do that anymore, all right? And so we have, in physics, we still use real numbers, of course, but we actually have to use um, what are called vectors. Okay, a vector is a special mathematical object that is useful in physics. In fact, most of physics is in the language of vectors. Okay, a vector is a mathematical object that possesses a magnitude and a direction. Okay, a magnitude is nothing but just a number, right? So a magnitude We refer to this as the size of a vector. It is a it is nothing but a scalar number. Like 3 or 14 or 2.78. It's just a number. It's a scalar number. But the vector also has a direction. Okay? So in one dimension we talk about one dimension, you know, we're, um, I'm sorry, yeah, one dimension, like we'll talk about in chapter two, we'll talk about the physics of one dimension. And so, and we haven't started chapter two yet, but when we go to chapter two, chapter two talks about movement. So chapter two, and again, we're still in chapter one. Chapter two deals with movement or motion in one dimension. So just one dimension is involved in chapter two. So our X, Y coordinate system, our Cartesian coordinate system, well, in, in one dimension, all we have is the real number line. So I may have zero and one and two and so forth. 
and I have negative one, negative two, what, and whatever. I mean, we have basically the real number line defines one dimension. There's only one dimension. We don't even have to refer, really refer to it as X or Y or anything like that, you know, essentially because we only are talking about a one dimensional universe in chapter two. Okay, and so, um, so what does it mean to discuss, let's say, a vector? Well, one of the vectors that we'll talk about in chapter two is called displacement. And that's why I hate talking about vectors when we're not even doing anything with vectors yet, right? Displacement is basically um, the length Um, or right, oh, sorry, let's put it this way. The uh, yeah, the length that an object has moved. And its direction. All right, and so if I'm talking about, let's just talk about, uh, for instance, um, I have to define an orientation when I discuss vectors. Now, in this case, I will define the positive, or define right as positive and left as negative. Those are my orientations. When I talk about a, a positive motion, it's motion that's going in, in to the right. And when I talk about negative or negative motion, it's motion that's going to the left. And again, I'm in one in when I talk about so if I talk about a displacement, if I decide I'm standing right here at what I'm gonna find is my origin. Okay, there's me standing at the origin. And I make a if I make a uh, displacement, well um let's put it this way. Uh I'll make one more thing. If I refer to what's called distance, that's the magnitude of displacement. So the magnitude of displacement is the distance. Yeah, we'll talk about all this in chapter two. Don't worry. So if I tell you that I moved such that my distance was three. Well, you really don't know where I moved. I could have moved from here to here. I could have done what would be called plus three. Or I could have moved from here to over here, to the left. And I could have done what was called minus three. Again, Plus three in one dimension, a direction is nothing but a plus or minus sign. That's all as simple as that. So again, I have what's called a two-fold ambiguity. I do not know when you tell me I just moved a size, a, dist, a, a distance of three. I do not know if I moved either plus three or minus three. It's 50-50 chance that you'd guess right. Plus three or minus three. So the so when you when you take what's called a magnitude or an absolute value, you know, for instance, you know, if I you know if I have I basically have two vectors that are size three. So in this case, there are two vectors that are size three. or distance equals three. And that is plus three and minus three, okay? The distance is really nothing more if I took a measuring, measuring tape and just measured how far I moved. And if I took that measuring tape and I measured out to the right or to the left, it would be the same. So when, again, when you take a distance of something, it is irrespective of direction. Okay, so the plus three and the minus three would be vectors. The magnitude is the size of, of the vector. 
It's either, it's, and in both cases, it's three. That is if I took the size of the vector, took a measuring tape, and I put it there. So I can either take a measuring tape from the origin to plus three, and a measuring tape from the origin to minus three, and that measuring tape is going to read the same. The distance is the direction in which I move, either positive or negative. Okay, that's all a vector is in one dimension. Now, it's interesting is that there is a nomenclature that's used to figure out the magnitude. If I want the magnitude of a vector, I put these bars around it. So if I take a vector, I call it x. Now, a vector, you write a vector, typically you put a hat on it. So you have x, which is the variable. The hat means a vector. So again, um, this is basically a, a hat on a variable denotes it as a vector. Okay, if I put a hat on the variable, just like that, it's like it looks like a, an arrow with one of the little uh, front, uh, front, front uh, sides, whatever, missing. Uh, like it looks like a half an arrow. Well, I put a I put that kind of a hat on a variable that denotes it as a vector. Now, what's interesting if I want the magnitude of that vector, what do I do? Well, the magnitude of x the nomenclature is I put these vertical bars around it. Now, we remember back in our elementary school days or, or, or junior high, high school, whatever, we refer to those as absolute value bars, right? We oftentimes refer to these as an absolute value. When you talk about real, we stuck real numbers in here, it was an absolute value. Well, a lot of times people say, well, you know, if you, to find an absolute value, what do you do? Well, if it's positive, you keep it positive, and if it's negative, you make it positive. Well, if somebody tells you that, they're absolutely wrong. You might get the right answer, but for the wrong reason. When you take an absolute value of a real number, a real number, remember, has two parts to it. It has the sign, the S-I-G-N sign, and it has a magnitude. When you take the absolute value of a real number, you are literally stripping it of its sign. You're taking off the sign part. It is signless. The only thing that I, what an absolute value does is it all it gives you is the magnitude. It strips off the sign, whether that sign is positive or negative. All you have is a magnitude. Okay? And so it's no accident that these, these vertical bars are in general used for any dimensionality of vectors. Even two-dimensional vectors. Those bars mean something different. Two-dimensional vectors are more complicated. We'll talk about them in a moment. Right now, we're talking about what things look like in one dimension. Okay? So one dimension things are pretty simple. If I say I have a vector of distance equal, let's say size three in one dimension, I have an ambiguity of two. Two-fold ambiguity. That means that there's, I have a basically two possible answers that can be true. Let's say size three, it could be plus three or minus three. If you don't tell me any more information, I have no way of knowing. Okay? Now, it turns out now, if you go to two dimensions, things get more complicated. So in two dimensions, you know, you'll start seeing chapter three. Chapter three is motion in two dimensions. That's really where we ought to probably talk about vectors. And that's really where OpenStax talk to, talks about vectors, okay? So chapter three, You know, again, we're not doing chapter three yet. I'm just giving you as an example. This is where we ought to be talking about vectors. But anyway, it is motion in two dimensions. What that means is I actually have to talk about an x-axis and a y-axis. Okay. So now I have the usual, you learn in algebra, yeah, the x, x axis, this is the, this is the horizontal axis and the y axis is the vertical axis. 
Now, I have to define an orientation when I do this. So if X, anything moving to the right, is positive. And Y, anything moving to the left, I'm sorry, and X, anything moving to the left is negative. And in the Y direction, anything moving up is positive. Anything moving down is negative. Again, this is an orientation that I must define. Now, I don't necessarily, there's, you'll, we'll find out there are some problems where it makes more sense to have a to have an upside down Y axis. Makes more sense. Again, we're actually free to define an orientation of the problem as we wish. Whatever works best for us. Whatever is convenient for us. Nature's going to do what nature's going to do. We are unimportant. All we are is observers. So, for us, we have the ability to observe nature in a manner that best benefits us, most as most advantageous to us. And so you'll find out that some problems are worked out best when you have an upside down y-axis. As weird as that may sound right now, but you know, it'll make more sense to you when we talk about chapter three. And you know, if I'm if I'm throwing a box out of an airplane, well, everything is going down, right? If I'm throwing a box of an airplane, I might as well just define all my variables as upside down because everything's going down 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 anyway right and so it makes most sense for me to find my variables that way right? and so again i define my so in this particular case in general without saying anything else in the old algebra one algebra two way of doing stuff i will end up just defining my my axis this way okay and so here's the here's the issue now you tell me you have a size three vector now, I really don't know much at all. I can have a size 3 vector this direction. I can have a size 3 vector this direction, this direction, this direction, this direction. Basically, I can do this an infinite number of times. Okay, so I have an infinite, infinite fold ambiguity. There's an infinite number of these size 3 vectors that I can draw. Unlike in one dimension, I only had, I had a coin flip. I'm either going to be to the positive or to the negative. Now, I have any number, an infinite number of these size 3 lines that I can draw about the origin that are all size 3. So unless you tell me another piece of information, I'm kind of stuck in the water here. So let me kind of erase a lot of these things. Let me kind of redraw this. So again, you know, you have an infinite fold ambiguity. Again, what am I saying? I'm saying, you know, in one dimension, two-fold ambiguity in two dimension. Now I'm in real trouble. I have an infinite fold ambiguity, which means I basically don't know much of anything. You need to give me another piece of information. And so the information you have to actually give me now is an angle. Okay, so there's my axes again. So let's give me an angle now. So I got to have an angle. And so I have an angle theta. And I have this size that you told me about. I'll call it, I'll call it X, uh, well, I'll call it, I'll call it R. And I'll take the hat off. When I take off the hat, that means it's the magnitude. So I just have a magnitude R. All right. And so now that I have to find this angle theta, I now have one vector, one unique vector that describes that. And so now I have to go off and do trigonometry. Because what I have to do, what I have to do now is I have to actually express this vector. Uh, I mean, I can express a vector in a, a couple of different ways. I can express a vector as a magnitude and direction. One way I can express a vector, or I can express a vector in X component and y component form. We call this component form.
Basically, I can define this vector as so much x and so much y. And in this class, we have to be comfortable going both ways. Okay, so let's kind of let's kind of go back and let's let's kind of talk about a little bit about trigonometry because we had we have to go do trigonometry now. So we can't just do a plus sign and a minus sign. Now we have to resort to trig. So let's kind of go one direction. Let's imagine that we have a vector size three. So I have a vector. We have a vector of size three. I'd like to use number three tonight, so we'll keep sticking with our style here. So I have a vector of size three. Whatever it is, I mean, it could be a, it could be a length, it could be a velocity. We haven't talked about velocity yet. It could be an acceleration, it could be a force. A whole bunch of things come in the form of vectors in physics. And so, right now, we're just talking about math, so we don't really care at this point what it represents. So, I have a vector of size three at an angle of. Let's see, where's that? Right there. I'm going to try to stay away from that bright light there. Okay. At an angle of 30 degrees above the positive x axis. Now, again, that's very important for you to tell me what angle I'm talking about. Because I actually have eight 30 degree angles that I can draw. So you got to tell me which 30 degree angle you're talking about. So what are we talking about here? Well, draw my axes. Here's X. Here's Y. Ah, uh, what what'd you say again? 30 degrees from the X axis, north of X or north of north of east. What do you want to call it? <clears throat> so that means that I have an angle. Drop my pen. I don't know what I did with it. Right. Um, draw this a little bit better. I have thirty degree angle, and we'll say, oops. Again, I'm told it's from the x-axis, so it's, we always do uh, counterclockwise rotations. We assume that. So thirty degrees or we'll say theta equals 30 degrees. And we'll say this is a size three. Okay, so we'll say this is R equals three, size three. Okay, I took the hat off. That basically means that, I, that this is the length. So I know the length and I know how it is oriented. I know how, how, I, how I have rotated it. Now the question is, well, that is one expression for a vector. I'm given the magnitude and a direction. That is the magnitude and direction expression. I want to write this in terms of components. And so this is my x-axis and my y-axis. So what do I do? How do I do that? Well, I realize that this is going to, I could actually, one of the things about x-y components is they actually meet each other at a 90 degree angle. They're called an orthogonal system. So XY system is what's called orthogonal. That's a fancy way of saying that the axes meet at a right angle. Okay, that means that I can draw a perpendicular down And that's a right angle. Basically, if I draw a line that's parallel to the y-axis, that forms a right angle. So what I have here is a right triangle. I have a right triangle, and I can now use trigonometry. So 
So I can actually break this up. I'm calling this a vector R. Currently, I know R. R is 3 in a direction theta equals 30 degrees above positive x axis. That's what, that's how I know R right now. What I can do is break it up into what I call R sub x and R sub y. What did I just say? Well, R sub x, if I write it out in English, that's R sub x. That means that's the subscript. I'm sticking it into a subscript. All I'm really doing is, is, is I'm basically decorating it. To, to tell you that that's the amount of R that's in the X direction. And I, when I said also, I said R sub Y. Well, in English, that's R sub, like a submarine, Y. R sub X, R sub Y. That's what I'm saying when I speak quickly. But again, I'm, I'm writing it in terms of these components. These are the components of vector. Basically, this vector R is so much R sub X in the X direction plus so much R sub Y in the Y direction. That's what it is. Okay? And so let me uh, erase a lot of this, uh, a lot of the English here. I'm going to keep the triangle up. So I'm going to erase a lot of this. I'm going to talk about how do I actually express these components. Okay, so how do I express the components of R, R sub X and R sub Y? How do I do that? Okay, so I have to use trigonometry. So I'm going to start off with R sub X. And I look at the triangle and say, oh, well, let's here. I know this angle theta. And I have this, I have this hypotenuse. Remember from geometry to hypotenuse. And so... How, how does the R sub X relate? Well, if I look at this angle, the R sub X line in this triangle is actually the adjacent. So I know the adjacent and I know the hypotenuse. What does that sound like? Well, it sounds like the cosine, doesn't it? Remember the cosine of theta? That's equal to the adjacent. And we're, I'm going to kind of go real slow on the trigonometry, and I'm probably in the in the light there. So hang on, let me write it a little bit lower. Uh, cosine of theta is the adjacent the adjacent leg uh, divided by the hypotenuse. Again, some of you guys, I'm going really slow tonight on trigonometry. Some of you guys, you know, might be right out of high school and maybe you had trigonometry uh, six months ago or a year ago. Some of you guys may have not had trigonometry for five years or ten years. So again, I'm, this first lecture, I'm kind of going over the trig a little bit slowly. This is a little bit of a mathematical review. When we get to chapter two and onward, I'm going to go through it faster. So you want to remind yourself of what certain things are again. Maybe you'll go back and look, listen to this video again, or at least you know fast forward to the place where I start talking about trig. Okay. So how does this relate to R, R sub x? Well, let's see here. Cosine theta. R. So the adjacent is what? That's R sub x. Hypotenuse, well again, the hypotenuse is the length along the, the length of R. R itself. Three in this case, size three. And so what I say now is I can actually do cross multiplication, can multiply the R with the cosine of theta, and I can write that R sub X is R times cosine of theta. So if I know R. The length of the vector in magnitude and direction form, and I know theta, then I multiply r times the cosine of theta, I can get 
the component of R in the X direction. Okay? Now I can do the same thing for the R sub Y. And I'll give you a few seconds here to write this down. And now I'm going to look at R sub Y. So kind of remember this. And I hope you're taking notes along, along, along with me as you go and watch this video. All right, so I'm going to erase this now. We're going to now look at R sub Y. Again, I don't have much whiteboard, so I kind of have to be a little bit more thrifty in how I do things. Okay, so R sub Y, what's that look like? It's another leg of my triangle. Well, in accordance with where the word, where theta is, is located, it's the opposite to the angle. Okay? So, see, opposite, and I know the hypotenuse. What's that sound like? That sounds like a sine, right? So sine of theta. Oops, I'm in the light again. Try to remember that. Um, sine of theta. Okay, is equal to the opposite divided by the hypotenuse. And review trigonometry. Some of you guys just had it. Some of you guys haven't had it for a while. So, again, I'm going to make the common denominator assumption that, you know, I'm going to speak to everybody in the class. So, so there you are, and so so okay. What? How does this relate to my uh, my variables now? Well, I got sine of theta opposite. What is that again? Oh yeah, it's r sub y. R sub y, and again the length of r, the hypotenuse, just r. I cross multiply yet again, cross multiply, and I can write that r sub y is r sine of theta. So I actually can express the, um, if I know the magnitude of the vector r, I know the angle at which the vector is oriented, theta, I can express the components, how much of r is in the x component via the r cosine theta, and I can express how much of, the, how much of it is contributed in the y direction, and that'd be r times the sine of theta. And I'll go through a numerical example, do not worry. In fact, I'll go through this example, right? So, <clears throat> now, most physics books actually have the, con the, the generalized way of writing vectors. Um, your book does not. And so, one of the ways of writing vectors in component form is use what are called unit vectors. Okay? So, I can write a vector like this. Like I said, I have R. R is a vector. And it's equal to um, R sub X and what I call X hat plus R sub Y multiplied by Y hat. So what are these funny things? Well, X hat is a, and Y hat are unit vectors. They are size one vectors. Size one. Means you're magnitude wise, you're not add, you're not doing anything other than multiplying one. They're size one vectors. And their only job is to point. in uh, an axis direction. So plus x does what? Plus x basically says, I'm a vector, that's, that's, you know, plus x basically means that way. Plus x is, you know, I'm, I'm pointing that way. Pointing along in a positive x-axis. Minus x, 
Well, again, size one, its only job is a point to the left. Plus y, uh, y hat, its job is a point up. And negative y hat, is its job is a point down. Their jobs are doing, to do nothing but the point, the direction. So they're basically what this r, r vector in general says is it's this much in the x hat direction along the x, along the x coordinate plus this much along the y coordinate. So I can express a vector in general by writing it in terms of its components. And in fact, I have to express it that way if I'm going to add and subtract vectors. All right, so I can't, I can't add or subtract vectors unless I express them in component form. So it becomes important in that, direct, in that way. And so again, um, these r sub x and r sub y's can be positive or negative. So it turns out that, you know, the way I drew this vector, it's first quadrant, right? First quadrant vector has a positive x and a positive y. A second quadrant vector has a, a negative x and a positive y. So again, negative x, positive y, second quadrant. Remember, this is first quadrant. This is second quadrant. A third quadrant vector has both a negative x and a negative y. A negative x, negative y, third quadrant. Okay, and a fourth quadrant vector has a positive x and a negative y. So positive x, negative y, that's a fourth quadrant vector. So again, you know, these r sub x's and r sub y's can be positive or negative. And I know a quadrant that the vector resides in by knowing the signs of those, of those components. Again, and again, I, I, I know where to draw my vector based upon whether, and whether, the, whether the components are positive or they're negative. Okay? And so, now, let me... Uh, Let's uh, do the example here that I gave you. Okay, so that's the math that's involved. Let's actually go and do my example. So what did I say again? I said that I had, in my example, I have a vector that is basically size 3, r equals 3, and theta has the value of 30 degrees. So what do I do? Well, I have to define r sub x, and I have to define r sub y, okay? And so what did I say? Well, I, I, I said that r sub x is r cosine theta. Well, that's going to be r sub x is going to be size 3 times cosine of 30. Now, again, you know, those of you taking the MCAT, you're not going to be allowed to have a calculator. So there's, there's some trigonometric uh, values you're going to have to remember. So one of them is what, what the trig functions are for cosine uh, for 30 degrees, one's for 60 degrees, 90 degrees, so on and so forth. So it turns out that the cosine of 30 is actually equal to the square root of 3 over 2. All right, so square root of 3 over 2 is cosine of 30. So what I actually have is r sub x is square root of 3 over 2, and that's going to be approximately, I'll just do it in my calculator, square root of 3 over 2 is about 0 0.866, but um, And I'll multiply that by 3, and it's approximately 2.598, I guess. All right, and so that's my r sub x. Uh, r sub y, well, how do I do that again? Look back in your notes. r sub y is r sine of theta. Well, in particular uh, terms, I have size 3 times the sine of 30 degrees. 
Now, one of those, you know, the relationships you remember in your trigonometry is the sine of 30 is a half. So R sub Y is going to be 3 times 1 half. Again, you can use your calculator in this class, of course. I'm just kind of telling you there's certain, for those of you who are going to take the MCAT someday to become a medical doctor, um, you're not going to be allowed to take your calculator in, right? So again, R sub Y will be 1.5. That's what it is, all right? 1.5 there. So it turns out that I can express the vector size three in the direction of 30 degrees. I can also express that vector. I know it's got to be, oh, let's see, am I in the light again? I'll try to stay out of it. I know that it's going to be R is R sub X, um, X hat plus R sub Y, Y hat. So I can express this vector as R in component form will be 2.598 X hat plus 1.5 Y hat. Notice that both of the components are positive. Both of them are positive tells me that this vector lives in the first quadrant. Now I'll give you another example of vector lives in the second quadrant in a moment. All right, and then we'll add vectors and I'll call this video done deal. All right, so it's already getting to be around an hour and a half as it is. All right, and so let's um, remember this here. You know, um, R is, I'll just kind of, let me hearken back to it in a moment I, I, so I don't have to redo stuff. So I'm gonna kind of write this down. So size three at 30 degrees. We know that R is 2.598 X hat plus 1.5 Y hat, all right? Or R is three over two square root of three X hat um, plus three halves Y hat. Now I just wanna use this as a reference. So we'll, we'll I'm gonna, Remember this vector in a minute when we go and, and teach about uh, adding vectors and subtracting. Okay. All right. So, what on the, what what happens on the other hand? Let's say if I have to go the other direction. What if I get some vectors in component form and somebody asks me to put that vector in in magnitude and direction form? What do I do then? Well, let's let's see. So I'm going to go the other way. And let's say somebody gives me. I'm just going to kind of go up right off of this. Let's say that somebody says, you have a vector, R, which is 2.598 X hat plus 1.5 Y hat. That's your vector in component form. Again, this is in component form. We want to go. to magnitude and direction. We want to go to the other form. Okay, how do I do that? Well, what I got to do is I got to go and use the Pythagorean theorem to get the magnitude. And so now I'm being told that, well, I don't know R and I don't know theta. I do know this much. I know which quadrant, I know how to draw my triangle. I know my triangle's in the first quadrant because both of these components are positive. So again, I know how to draw my triangle. You know, uh, uh, you know if I were to look at the various uh, quadrants, I know how to draw my triangle, right? And so, well, let's see. I don't know, this time I don't know R. I'm gonna kind of recycle the values that it's got done using. And this time I don't know theta. I do know that R sub X is 2.598, and I do know that R sub Y is 1.5. And so what I'm going to do is, well, let's see if I know, uh, I have a right triangle, 
and I know both both of the legs of the triangle, you know, and I don't know the hypotenuse. Well, how do I go about getting the hypotenuse? Why well, use good old Pythagorean theorem? So I go and do the Pythagorean theorem. Remember, Pythagorean theorem says that r squared equals r sub x squared plus r sub y squared. Well, I can solve for that. I get the square root of each side. r is equal to the square root of r sub x squared plus r sub y squared. Okay. And so in this case, I can say, oh, okay, well, r... It's the square root of, let's see, 2.598 squared plus 1.5 squared. Take the square root of all of that, square root of that sum. And if you do that in your calculator, you now you go to your calculator and you say, okay, I got, you know, I got my... 2.598 squared, that's going to be 6.7496, blah, 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 plus 1.5 squared, add it up, I'm going to get like 8.9996, and, and I take that sum, I take the square root of 0 0.5 power of the square root of all that, I get 3, or basically pretty close to it, 2.9999333, whatever, pretty close to 3. So in our case, I just got done recovering that if I know those two sides, that that's three. Okay? Now, how about the angle? Now, sure, I mean, now that I know this is three, I, I have sine, cosine, and tangent at my expense. But what, what about what about the angle now? So let's, 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 um, let's just, for instance, let's kind of go and express the givens. And so what I know going into this problem is what? I have this angle. I know the opposite and I know the adjacent. I don't initially know the hypotenuse. So if I do that, I have to kind of remind myself, well, what's the trigonometric function that relates the opposite and the adjacent? Well, let's see, that was the tangent, wasn't it? Going back to trig, I know the tangent of theta is the opposite Divided by the adjacent. Okay. I got to be careful, though. You know, there's there's all kinds of different triangles. Like I could draw a triangle, right triangle this way. You know, there's all kinds of ways I can actually express an opposite and, and, and an adjacent. It doesn't always have to be y divided by x. It could, in some cases, for some different kinds of triangles... Depending upon what angle I have, it could be x over y. What I have to remind myself here is it's the opposite over the adjacent. Turns out for this angle, the opposite is r sub y, and the adjacent is r sub x. That means in this case, the tangent of theta, I don't know theta yet. The tangent of theta is going to be what? It's going to be r sub y, the opposite. In this case, that's, it is, that is indeed r sub y divided by the adjacent, which is r sub x. I'll take the inverse uh, inverse um, form or inverse function of this. I'll, I'll take the inverse tangent of each side. If I take the inverse tangent or the arc tangent of the tangent, I get theta back. So I'll take the arc tangent of each side. or the inverse tangent, if you will, however you like to write it. Uh, hang on. Write this again. Take the arc tangent of each side. Of the equation. And I get that the theta is equal to the inverse tangent Tangent with a little negative one up there. That means inverse tangent in your calculator of r sub r sub y over r sub x. Inverse tangent. Well, what's that mean? 
How do I do that? Well, in this case, what are my values? Well, I have theta is equal to the inverse tangent. Let's see, what do I have again? I have 1.5. Divided by 2.598. All right. So how do I do this in my calculator? Well, I usually, everybody's calculator is different. I usually do, I do second function tangent. And I'll put in inside the fraction, inside or I'll, inside the, the parentheses. You probably can't see that. Inside the parentheses, you have 1.5 divided by 2.598. I close the parentheses and I say equal, and it's going to be 30.000 degrees. All right. And so again, I come to find out that I essentially retrieved the initial problem that I did in the first place. It's 30 degrees. So, so again, I, I would then, as my final answer, I'd say, oh, okay, you gave me R in component form. I'm going to give it back to you as R is equal to 3, whatever. I mean, I don't know units right now, so um, I'm just going to say 3. Maybe some units, maybe meters, maybe newtons, whatever. Um, in a, uh, at an angle of 30 degrees, above positive x axis. I have to be specific. 30 degrees means nothing to me. There are eight possible 30 degree angles that I can write on in this two dimensional figure. So it means nothing to me. You have to tell me what 30 degree angle you're talking about. Oh, the one that's above the x positive x axis, that 30 degree angle. Okay, well, and again, you also have to tell me that that's actually the positive x-axis. Again, these are things you have, to, you have to define for me. Otherwise, I don't know. And you can't just leave me guessing. I, you know, unless you tell me what's plus x and what's minus, which is minus x, what's plus y, which is minus y. I have no way of knowing. All right. And so that's the um, the way of going the other way. So initially, I gave you you I I, I got a magnitude and a direction. I went to component form using trigonometry. The second way, I was given a number in component form and I went back to magnitude and direction. Again, those are the two ways of expressing a vector. Okay, now what I want to last do to end this video is I want to talk about operations on a vector. So again, when you're a kid, you know, you're essentially given uh, mathematical objects called real numbers and what do that what do they do then well i got these mathematical objects called real numbers and i have to know how to add subtract multiply and divide them i have to i have to understand what operations i can perform well now you have a new mathematical object called a vector and anytime you have a new mathematical object as you move up in mathematics you get vectors you go high up you get matrices you get all kinds of other other kinds of objects, and you have to define how do you do these operations? What operations and how do you do them? All right, and so what we have to do is, and again, I'm going to talk about addition and subtraction of vectors tonight in this video. Um, multiplication is, is much different. In fact, there are two forms of multiplication uh, for vectors. And again, we'll talk about those. They're going to be very important in this class. But I, it's too complicated to talk about right now. So I'm going to leave it in a, in, and we don't have a division of vectors. And remember, though, in your math class that really the only things that actually exist are addition and multiplication. Subtraction is nothing but the addition of the opposite. And multiplication and division is nothing but the multiplication of an inverse. Right. And so in general, we only ever have addition and multiplication in the most general sense. So what does it mean to add vectors? So let's talk about the addition of vectors. How do we do it? 
Well, we have to get vectors in some sort of a component form. Okay, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna give an example of a couple vectors that we're just gonna and I will convert them and we'll add them and then we'll go through a, we'll go through one uh, lengthy example of how you know how to add vectors and what they mean, right? But right now, let's just assume that I have a vector a, and I can express it as an a sub x x hat plus a b sub x. I'm sorry, um, scratch that. A sub x, x hat, plus an a sub y, y hat. I don't know why I wrote that. All right. A sub x, x hat, so we have so much. Uh, this, is a form, uh, this is a component of a in the x direction. x hat, again, is the unit vector, plus an a sub y, y hat. That's a. I have another vector B, put a hat on it, I have, and it's given as B sub X, X hat, plus B sub Y, Y hat, and I, I may have had to do some work to get this, I may have had to do some trigonometry or whatever to get these A sub X, A sub Y, B sub X, A sub B sub Y, right now I just want to, I don't want to talk about that, I'll give you that as an example, I'm just going to assume though, one way or the other, we have these two vectors expressed in component form. How do you add them? Well, you add vectors component by component. That's how you add in vector language. I form a new vector. I'll call it C. Well, C is A plus B. Again, what does plus mean in vector language? We have to define that. It's different than what it means in arithmetic. A plus B. That's how you write it. Just like you would, but you, you know, just like you would with uh, real numbers, uh, you know, or scalar values, except you now have to put these hats on, and it means something different now. You're adding two vectors that are of magnitude and direction and space, and you're getting, out of this, you're getting a third vector that in and of itself has a magnitude and direction and space. All right, so how do you do this? Well, remember what A means. It means A sub X, X hat, plus A sub Y, Y hat. That's what A means, the substituting. Plus B, well, that means B sub X, X hat, plus B sub Y, Y hat. And what am I gonna do? I'm gonna add component by component. So basically what this is gonna be is it's gonna be uh, adding up all the components in the X direction, A sub X plus B sub X, okay. X hat, again, I form, I form what C is. This is. I would probably call this C sub X. It's A sub X plus B sub X. That quantity, these are just real numbers added together. So it might be positive or negative. In the X hat direction. Plus, collecting the Y components. I have A sub Y and I have B sub Y. Add them together, A sub Y plus B sub Y. Again, these are just real numbers. They'll be positive or negative. Multiply by Y hat. I take two vectors, I put them in component form, and I literally add them component by component. And that would be the, a totally different new vector. C, we call this the resultant. over here. When you add up the vectors, you get what's called a resultant. A resultant is what you get when you add two or more vectors. 
a resultant, like the word result, but he put an A-N-T at the end, resultant. Okay, so then that, that is a result of adding two or more vectors together, the resultant vector. All right, so let's, um, let's give an example. I'm going to do a little bit of work here now, okay? So I'm going to I'm going to make I'm going to take this addition of vectors and I'm now going to I'm going to imply it. Now I'm going to try to use the results that I just got done using before. So I'm going to rehash what I called R before. The vector is size 3 at 30 degrees. I'm going to add it to another vector. Okay? So um <clears throat> remember I had two vectors. I mean, I, I, I have I have two vectors I'm going to express, and the vectors are going to be what I told you before, so I can kind of save a little bit of work and time. So I got this vector r, and again, this is what positive x, pop negative x, positive y, negative y. Okay, I got this one vector that I'll call R. Okay, its magnitude is 3, and it's at an angle of 30 degrees. It's in, again, vector R, size 3, angle of 30 degrees. It is in the first quadrant. I'm going to complicate things a little bit. I'll make another vector. I'll call it S. And I'll write that vector in the second quadrant. I don't know how pretty the numbers are going to be, but I'll, I'll write this vector. And I'll call it S. Okay. And I'll say that vector has a size, I don't know. We'll say size 4. Okay, size 4. And I'll say that it's, at an angle of 60 degrees. Okay, so again, I have I have a vector in the first quadrant of size three at an angle of 30 degrees from the positive x direction. I have another vector called S, a little vector hat on it. It is of size four, and it's at 60 degrees compared to the negative x hat direction. Okay, so again, I have um, I would I, I have R is of size 3 at 30 degrees above positive x-axis. Okay, I have vector s, and it's of size 4. Let's make enough numbers, guys. Um, it's at 60 degrees um, above negative x-axis. Okay. So I'm going to complicate things, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have some, you know, at least some sort of negative components going on here, and kind of see how that works. Those are the two vectors that I have. Okay. Now, I've already done all the hard work in the past to get to get R. Right. I'm just going to go back to your notes, go back a few frames here in the video, but let's recall that R. We did all this work. We're just reusing it because I want to be lazy, I guess. R is going to be 2.598 X hat. We're probably in the light here. Uh, plus uh, 1.5 Y hat. Okay, so that's, I'm just going to, I mean, you know, that's, I already know this. I'm going to reuse it. Okay. I got to do a little bit of work to get S. Now, I'm going to point out some concepts here. Once I know the quadrant in which my triangle resides, I don't have to care at all about plus or minus sides of the length because I, I, I now know what, what, what angle the triangle resides. I can just basically pull that triangle out and just use it and, imagine, and, and basically use its lengths. And not worry about taking an you know taking a, a sine or cosine of large angles and getting all messed up you know with negative signs and stuff. Let's just be simple, all right? 
So let's just kind of pull this triangle out. And I know because it has, I know basically it, it, it's a second quadrant triangle. So whatever length that I happen to get when I do trigonometry in the x direction, that length is really going to be negative because it really is pointing in a negative x direction. I know that because it's a second quadrant vector. And whatever the length I get along y, that's going to be positive. How do I know that? Again, because it's a second quadrant vector. So that information is basically wrapped up in that uh, and, and, you know, and, and I don't have to really worry about things anymore. And I can just do the math of just positive, positive lengths. Okay, that's, I, I just want to do, I just want to figure out the lengths of a triangle with a local angle and not worry about additional negative signs if they come into play. And this is how I avoid that, right? So what I have here now is I, I've, I've taken this triangle and extracted it out. I rewrote it right here. And because, again, I'm, I'm working with an orthogonal system, I know that this angle is a right is a right angle. I know I have a right triangle. Okay? I have this magnitude S. I took the hat off. S equals 4. And I know that this is going to be S sub Y and S sub X. That's the amount of S in the x direction, in the x, you know, horizontal, if you will. And this is the amount of, of, of s in the y direction. I have another triangle. And I'm going to do the very, very similar math. I'm going to be a little faster than last time. Okay? And so what I'm going to sell you is, oh, let's see here. I, I got this other angle, uh, 60 degrees. So let's see. What did I say again? I said s sub x is the adjacent of hypotenuse. Well, S sub X, remember we did the cross multiplication. It really comes out to be S cosine 60. Not cosine negative 60 or cosine of, of 120 or anything like that. It's, it's a local angle. I just wrote out a local triangle so that all I care about are lengths. And I can worry about the, their, their signs later when I remember what quadrant they came from. Okay, that's a way to not get yourself wrapped up uh, um, unnecessarily in negative signs. Because trigonometry will kill you if you if you, if you allow it to uh, to uh, get you wrapped around the axle regarding negative signs. You don't want to do that. You want to just kind of keep things as simple as possible. You know, physics is complicated enough without overcomplicating it, right? And so let's just kind of do this right now. Um, I have S. What's S again? It's 4 cosine of 60. Well, let's see here. Those of you taking the MCAT. Well, we know that the cosine of 30 is the square root of 3 over 2, and the sine of 30 was 1 half. Well, it turns out the cosine of 60 is 1 half, and the sine of, of 60 is square root of 3 over 2. They kind of flip-flop. All right, and so this is going to be cosine of 60 is going to be 1 half. It turns out this is nicely equal to 2. S sub y, on the other hand, is not as pretty. It's going to be S sine of 60. All right. And again, this is a 4. 4 sine of 60 is going to be a square root of 3 over 2. Or it'll be 2. 4 over 2 is 2. 2 square root 3. All right. And so S of Y, if I want to get a numerical approximation for it, um, 2 square root of 3. Again, <clears throat> it'll be um, 1.7, oops, square root of 3 is 1.73 multiplied by 2. I get about 3.464. Again, you know, it's just an approximation. That's why I put this little wiggly uh, equal sign here. So 3.464. So if I want to write S out in component form, now I have, to, I will now worry about, so let's just kind of write it up here. Now that I know these lengths, now I, I can assign, I can assign signs to them. 
So again, I know the S of Y as a length is 3.464. I know S of X as a length is 2. But now I have to ask myself the question, what quadrant is this in? Oh, it's in the second quadrant. That means in the second quadrant, X is negative and Y is positive. Now I, I now it's time for me to sign the, the, the signs. Let's see here. That means that I got to make this negative. Make it a 2X hat. And then in a second, a second quadrant vector has a positive Y. Plus 3.464 Y hat. All right. And so... Those are my two vectors. Okay, so I got to do a little bit of work to get them as component form. There's no way around that. Okay, so I have a vector in the first quadrant, size three, second quadrant, size four, and there they are in this component form. I got to do that much work to get me in component form in the first place. Now I'm going to do so a little bit of erasure here. I want to utilize this, and now I want to add these two vectors up. So I'm going to create a vector C, and we're going to say that it's, a, it's caused by the addition of R plus S. So C is my resultant vector. It's equal to R plus S. Okay. What does that mean? Well, C is equal to what is R? Again, signs are very important here, S-I-G-N sign. So, so again, R is positive 2.598X hat plus 1.5Y hat plus, what's S? S is negative 2, do not forget that negative sign or everything you're doing here is wrong, X hat plus 3.464 y hat. And now I'm gonna combine like terms. And so I collect all the x hats together. I get 2.598 minus two x hat plus, and here I get what? 1.5. Plus 3.464. Y hat. There we go. Again, adding them how? Component by component. Now I have all the X hats together, all the Y hats together. I've resolved all the signs. And now what's left to do is basically write out the final answer. So I'm going to reuse this little space here. So C is going to equal 2.598 minus 2 is 0 0.598. X hat. And now I have 3.464 plus 1.5. I'll just use my calculator. 3.464 plus 1.5. I get 4.964. Okay. So the question that really comes down to is, well, when I add these two vectors together, the resulting vector C is in what quadrant? Hmm. Well, it's got a positive X and a positive Y. So a quadrant that has where the vector has a positive X and a positive Y is the first quadrant. So C, whatever it is, it resides in the first quadrant. Okay, why do I know that? Because it has a positive X and a positive Y. All right? So that is the vector C. Now, I can just focus on that. Now, the question is, oftentimes in mathematics, how you're given a problem is how you have to return the problem. You're given a problem where you're, you're, you're fed two vectors that are in terms of magnitude and direction. So it'd be the kind and uh, convenient thing for you to do for you to return the answer in magnitude and direction, which means I got one more thing to do. I got to go and do Pythagorean theorem and inverse tangent to get C in the form that is in the same form that I was given it. That's usually the 
respectable thing to do in science is to return the problem in the same format in which you're given the problem. Okay, and so let's do that. So let's just kind of keep track of what C is. I'm gonna erase all this other stuff because I'm kind of done with R and S right now. So I've added these two vectors up. I'm gonna keep C. And we're almost done with this video. One of the things too is that if the video is, is really long and you know you can always mark down the time that you left last left off and then get back to it later. So that's the beauty about a video. So again, what did I get come up with? I got, I came up with C is 0.598x hat, again positive, plus 4.964. So basically I have a vector that I mean, it's kind of, let's kind of figure out what I expect physically from this vector. Well, it's first quadrant. It's kind of stubby in the x-axis, and it's, and it's tall in the y-axis, right? So it's a vector that has a lot of y and not too much x. So it's going to have a, it's going to be, you know, longer than the other vectors. And it's going to have a fairly large angle theta. Or maybe a small angle. It's going to be, I mean, I'm going to kind of guess that this vector is probably going to be 65, 70 degrees. I don't know. I haven't done the math yet. But it's going to be fairly large. It's going to be a lot of, a lot of Y and not much X. And I know that it's in this. So this is my vector C. I know that it's in the first quadrant because the X component and Y component are both positive in the first quadrant. All right. And so what I got to do now is work out um, what this vector is. So, um, so first of all, I don't know the magnitude of C. I got to find that first. How do I find the magnitude of C? I use Pythagorean's theorem. So I know that C squared, oh, this is do two steps in one. C is a square root of 0 0.598 squared plus 4.964 squared and square root of all that, okay? And so, again, I'm using Pythagorean's theorem. And again, let's just work this stuff out. So 0.598 squared is, I get like 0.3576 for those doing, doing it on your own. And I would actually, Say you should have your own calculator out and notes and kind of doing the same math with me. Because, I mean, there's points where I'll mess up the math. So write me an email and say, hey, uh, Professor Callahan, I think you messed up the math. So and I'm pretty happy and I'll recorrect it. Uh, plus 4.964 squared. I get 24.999. And, okay, so I get something like, like uh, the square root of 24.999 or so. And wow, this is actually a complete accident. I didn't mean to do this, but uh, this actually turns out to be about five. This is an absolute accident. <laughs> I just made these numbers off the top of my head and it turns out I got about 5.0. All right, so that's the magnitude of, of C. Now the question is, what is the, uh, what's the direction? Well, again, I'm first quadrant. So opposite, if I'm doing this angle here, opposite, would be C sub Y, and the adjacent would be C sub X. So I would look at a tangent of what I'm calling theta as basically the opposite in this case, not always Y, but this in this case Y, divided by the adjacent. Okay, and of course I would use the arc tangent. I would get theta is the inverse tangent of c sub y over c sub x, which is the inverse tangent of, uh, let's see here, what do I know? Well, c sub y is that 4.964. c sub x is 0.598. And I come out that theta is equal to whatever that comes out to be. It's a fairly big angle. Inverse 
tangent, arc tan, second function tangent. My calculator reads as tangent negative one, which is kind of the way I wrote here. And you put the fraction side, 4.964 divided by 0.598. And I get 83.1 degrees. That's a, even a bigger angle than I expected. 83.1 degrees. 83.1. All right. So um, instead of writing the C down, what I can actually do, I'm going to erase some of this stuff here to cut myself some space here. I'm going to write the final answer. Okay. So I'm going to write the final answer, and it's going to be careful here. Instead, I, I can write it in component form, my answer, when I did the addition. Or I can write my final answer as what? I can write it as 5.0 in a direction or at, or at an angle at 83.1 degrees above positive x-axis. These are absolutely two equivalent ways of writing C. This is in component form. This is in magnitude direction form. So again, let's kind of recap. I was given two angles. Oh, sorry. Two vectors that are in magnitude and direction. I call them R and S. One was the first quadrant vector. One was the second quadrant vector. I had to express them both in component form. Turns out that, you know, so I, again, I, I already, I, I did the, the, you know, the first quadrant vector earlier in the, in the video. So I just kind of re rehashed what I did. Second quadrant vector, actually I call it A and B. Second quadrant vector B, I, oh no, I can't say hello, S, yeah, S, I'm sorry, S. Second quadrant vector, uh, I, I had to remind myself that I did, I worked it out in local, and as a, as a local triangle, but whatever my length was in X, because it is the second quadrant vector, that length in X is negative, and the length in Y is positive, because it is the second quadrant vector. So I had two vectors that I expressed in terms of components. I added them component by component to create vector C. So C equals R plus S. R and S are vectors. C is a vector. And then I had a vector that was in component form. And then, well, it's always... Uh, um, a conventional thing to return a problem as you got it. So I was given this problem. I was given, you know, I was given two vectors in magnitude and direction. So I, it's only right for me to return my answer in terms of magnitude and direction. So I had to use Pythagorean's theorem to get the magnitude and the inverse tangent to get the direction. And so finally, this first quadrant vector plus the second quadrant vector. So the first quadrant vector R plus the second quadrant vector S added together gives me a different looking vector, a resultant vector that is actually in the first quadrant. We call that C. Okay. Now, only one last thing to talk about in this video, and that's subtraction. And I'm going to call it a done deal. So subtraction is not too big of a deal. Um, it's basically the addition of the opposite. So let's say, for instance, that I have, um, you know, my two vectors here. Uh, let's see if I remember them here. So I have, instead of R, uh, C equals R plus S. Let's say I want to do R minus S. Let me recall here, R was 2.598X hat plus... Uh, 1.5 y hat and s was what was it it was negative 2 x hat plus i think it was 3.464 y hat if i recall is that right yeah and so i i did r plus s right so what did i really do well i took r and I added S. And so, again, I, um, no, there's a way of, there's a way of adding vectors via components or algebraic way. There's also a way of adding them uh, through what's called graphical. 
And so if I take two vectors, let's say A and B, let's say I, I, I want to add uh, A and B together. Let's say I have, I have A that I express as kind of an, an aside, and I'm going to add it to B. There's just two vectors in space. A plus B is I write the vector A just as it is. Okay, I write the vector A, and I and I write it in terms of you know the, well, I'll have an or, its own origin. I take the vector B, and I do what's called tip to tail. I literally lift it and I put the tail of B on the tip of A. I literally lift B, make a brand new coordinate system for B right at the tip of A, and I write B exactly as it is, at the exact same length as it is. There's B, and then I literally will just take as a result, and the resultant is going to be literally nothing more than going from the tail of the first to the tip of the last. And this is called the graphical method of adding vectors. Tail of the first to the tip of the last, and that would be R equals a plus b okay and so again you know this is called tip to tail so again the r is r is resultant so you literally place tail of b on tip of a and then the resultant is a vector drawn from the tail of the first vector to the tip of the last. Okay, so in my case, I had R and S. Right, and so I had a vector that looked a little bit different. So I had two vectors in space. I had R plus S. So I had R, which was, uh, what was it? Um, it was uh, quite a bit of X and not so much Y, so it's 30 degree angle. So something like this was my R. And then my S was more Y than X, I guess it was 60 degrees. So there is my S. And the question is, well, if I if I use this particular graphical way of adding vectors, again, this is called the graphical method. Graphical method. This up here is the algebraic method. So what you saw up here was the algebraic method. We're only going to use the algebraic method in class. Uh, we used to have a lab, well, we had a lab where we're meeting physically. No, that did that did both. You rarely ever did. The, I'm just kind of giving it to, to you as a way of looking at it. So, but when I did A plus B, let's kind of figure out what I did. I, or sorry, R plus S. I drew my R. Let's draw this better. And then my S. And this is my R. And I took the tail of S and put it at the tip of R. So it means that my S looks something like this, with this being its own system. And I come to find out that my answer, my R plus S, ended up being a vector that had that was really mostly Y and not so much S. So this is what I call C. I basically R plus S got me C. Well, minus S. So if I do R minus S, let's get let's say that gives me a vector D. Well, R minus S is really R plus a negative S. I'm really adding the opposite of S. The opposite of S is basically an, a vector that's drawn at a 180 degree angle from itself. So this would actually be negative S. Negative S would actually be the would actually be a fourth quadrant vector. So thinking about it graphically, what do I expect to happen? Well, D, if I look at D, I'd say, well, I'm going to add R plus a negative S. 
So I add my, I put my R like I would before, graphically, just draw it on a piece of paper. I'm going to add another vector, totally different vector, this vector, S. So take the tail of S on the tip of R. I expect a vector that's basically third quadrant. Has a lot of X and not much Y. Okay, so it's kind of, kind of have a shallow angle. And so again, adding graphically, you, you draw R as it is with its own origin. You put a whole a brand new origin on, on the tip of R, and then you just basically place exactly how it's oriented, the tip of S on the, I'm sorry, the, the tail of S and the tip of R. And then you draw, the resultant is drawing a line from the tail of the first to the tip of the last. You can draw three vectors this way. You can keep drawing vectors like this, so I'd nauseam if you want. But anyway, I expect to have a vector this third quadrant when I do this. So let's see what happens if I do that. So I'm going to add r, and then we'll, we'll say this at the end. This is the subtraction. All right, so r plus a negative s is what, is what this is. r minus s. I'm doing a new subtraction. Okay. What is negative s? Well, if one of the things that know, to know about is I, if I multiply a scalar by a vector, let's say I have a scalar as, or a is a scalar, a times s. A scalar is a fancy way of just saying a number. I take that a, whatever that number is, and I multiply it by each component. That means if s is, is equal to s of x, x hat, plus s of y, y hat, and I want to multiply that vector by some sort of a scalar, say 3 or something, or 2, well, I take that scalar and I distribute it to each component. So I'd have a s of x, x hat, plus a s sub y, y hat. Each component gets multiplied by a. So if I say negative s, that's the fancy way of saying negative 1 times s. That means that each component is the opposite of what it was before. Negative s of x, x hat minus s sub y, y hat. Again, multiply by scalar. So in this case, Negative s is going to be negative of the first component. That's negative of negative 2 is a positive 2. x hat. And then negative of the y component, that's negative 3.464 y hat. And so if I'm adding, say, d which is r minus s, that merely means that I'm adding r plus negative s. And so this really comes down to being, what's r? Well, it's going to be 2.598 x hat uh, plus 1.5 y hat. r stays the same. Plus negative s, so it's positive 2x hat, minus 3.464y hat, all right? And so if I do that, I find out now that my, what I call d is going to be what? Well, it's going to be 2.598 plus 2. x hat plus what? I have 1.5 minus 3.464. Okay. So I'm going to erase this. And all I'm going to do is work this out. So I have d is 4.598 x hat. 
and then 1.5 minus 3.464 is going to be negative, right? So again, 1.5 minus 3.464, I get negative 1.964. Okay, so that's my D. So what quadrant does it live in? Before I predicted it would be third quadrant. Am I right? So let's see. Well, it's going to be third quadrant. X and Y. See, third quadrant is what? Third quadrant is a, is a vector that has a positive X and negative Y. I have a positive X and a negative Y. Yes, I live in the third quadrant. I would draw the vector looking like this. That's my D. This would be uh, d sub x, and this would, I'm sorry, this would be d sub y, and this would be d sub x. All right, and so, and this is my vector d. And of course, what do I want to do? Well, I know it's third quadrant, and I, and of course, the last thing I want to do is I want to get the magnitude and direction. So again, I go with Pythagoras, and that's going to be taking the hat off the d, I get 4.598 quantity squared plus a negative 1.964 quantity squared. So again, squares are always positive. I get the magnitude of D is 4.598 quantity squared plus 1.964 squared and that's going to be, again, 24.999. Square root of that, I get about 5 again. But this time, I have a different angle. And this angle theta will be the inverse tangent, again, of a local triangle. So I don't have to worry about negative signs. It'll be inverse tangent of the opposite d sub y over the adjacent d sub x. Theta be the inverse tangent of what? Again, I don't care about negative signs, right? So this is a positive length in this case for local triangle. So the y is 1.964. The x is 4.598. And so I come out that my theta when I do this, it's going to be the inverse tangent of 1.964 divided by 4.59, oops, inverse tangent, 1.964 divided by 4.598, 23.13. How would I write this then? Well, I would write, um, I guess this is D. So D, I could write, um, I'm going to erase some stuff to conserve space here. I know it's size 5, and I know what that angle is. So I'm just going to write the final answer. So the final answer is D is equal to 5.0 at 23.13 degrees below positive x-axis. And that, again, is what, uh, that's my D, which was, again, R minus S. So, again, all subtraction is in vectors is the opposite, is addition of the opposite. Okay, and with that, that's all I'm going to talk about in Chapter 1. All right? And so um, that's going to be it for this video.